it's futuristic, it involves uh, innovation and inventions and uh, the realities of getting a, a project like this done in a city like New York with all the kind of uh, bureaucracy and red tape that you have to cut through and know how to negotiate uh, fundraising and um, most of all, it's technology that really can help a lot of people if it comes to fruition. And it's also a model for any kind of development that might take place in other cities, not only in the United States, but anywhere that's of an underground nature. You're saying that it's the first one? Of, of, certainly of its type, which is pretty interesting. You know, if you thought about where the High Line was 10 or 12 years ago, I mean, if you walked around Chelsea, go to the art galleries or something, I mean, it didn't exist. It was this abandoned entity and People were talking about it for years, and, and it took a while, but it's turned into something that's just a magnet for the city. And, and I can see something like the low line uh, rivaling it. So I'm going to introduce Dan very briefly. I encourage you to go to thelowline.org to learn more about it. There's a, a Kickstarter video, I believe, about that that gives a pretty good overview. And uh, Dan is certainly the one of the, uh, the primary movers in this project. So. He leads community engagement, political outreach, fundraising, and strategic planning for the world's first underground park. His former roles have included strategic roles at Google, PopTech, and within New York City government. It's a pretty unique combination of uh, expertise. So I'm going to uh, ask you to please welcome Daniel. Thanks. All right. All right. Thanks so much for that. Thanks everyone for coming tonight. Uh, I hope I am um, able to deliver the, the two dollars worth that you all gave, <laughs> and uh, it's a it's a really funny room to be in here. I feel like you know you can't see the, the, the judges thing behind the screen, but it's like I know all these guys looking down on us. It feels like a very formal environment, but I want to keep this informal, and you guys should please feel free to interrupt, ask questions, and uh, just have fun with this idea um, that we think is so fun. So. As mentioned, my name is Dan Barish. I'm the co-founder of The Low Line, which is an effort to build the world's first underground park. And let me start by asking how many of you have heard of the project so far? Whoa, all right, okay. So I think what I'll do is, um, uh, I don't need to explain exactly what the project is in that much detail. It sounds like you guys probably have a little bit of background. Um, we'll go through that a little bit more quickly. We'll talk a little bit about the, um, the inspiration for the project. Uh, and talk a little bit about what we've accomplished so far and, and really sort of where we're going. So I think the first question is why underground? And this is something that it's interesting. Some people, uh, when we say the world's first underground park, they ask, um, why would you possibly want to go underground? And there's a lot of reasons for that, especially here in New York. For those of you who <laughs> have seen one of my favorite films, The Warriors, uh, the, the, the subway system in the underground in New York has long been characterized as something that is unsafe and dangerous and really not very valuable. Uh, this is uh, another uh, image that might remind you of even your commute this morning. Uh, but it doesn't need to be that way. This is a picture of the Moscow uh, metro. And here you can see uh, an environment that is, um, has the highest levels of design and it's really something that uh, delivers uh, some soaring architecture uh, and creates a, a spirit of, uh, of really a dynamic public space. This is a photo, one of our favorites, there's a Sicilian immigrant uh, who is uh, living in, in California who created uh, a multi-acre entirely underground space and he created a little garden here um, that is entirely underground. Um, one of the sources of inspiration for us is really sort of looking at you know others who have imagined and thought about uh, what could happen underground. And then this is one of our favorites also. You know, uh, Mr. Mario Brothers is one of the most popular video games of all time for a reason. Uh, it plays upon all of the elements of video games uh, that succeed, but specifically uh, multiple worlds and multiple universes. And in the Super Mario Brothers environment, uh, as you guys may remember, uh, the underground is full of surprises, full of value. And this is something that, uh, you know, is very fun and, and close to us too. So New York City, uh, busy, crazy place. Um, uh, most people spend a lot of their time thinking about uh, what's above ground, but increasingly people are interested in the history and there's quite a bit of it underground. There's acres and acres of spaces underneath uh, our city streets that have been dug out at some point in history. Uh, and here, this is actually a group of people who are going on a now defunct tour in Brooklyn uh, of a former trolley station. 
We uh, came across this site, it's the former Williamsburg Trolley Terminal Space, uh, a couple of years ago actually, I think you know, 2010. We learned about uh, this from some um, old MTA employees who, uh, it was part of sort of the lore of the MTA, uh, the, the existence of this space. It was used um, to transfer uh, trolley car passengers over the Williamsburg Bridge, uh, and I'll show you on a map where it is, but, but really it was designed in the streetcar era for trolley cars to go back and forth from Brooklyn to Manhattan, uh, uh, depositing its passengers on the Manhattan side of the, of the bridge, and then the passengers would then go up and, uh, and go above ground. And the site has been abandoned since 1948. It's uh, directly adjacent to an existing subway station, the Jay-Z, and uh, the site is uh, about an acre, uh, actually a little bit over an acre in size. Uh, we convinced the MTA to, get, to let us get down there, and we saw quite a lot of fun stuff. This has actually been painted over recently, uh, but the existence of cobblestones, the existence of a lot of uh, uh, really fun details on the left there is, uh, if you guys can see, way in the back there, probably not, um, the uh, existence of this former control tower, which we immediately thought would be something that would be like a kid's playhouse, or almost a treehouse in the, in the reimagined use of the space. This is the space recently cleaned up, and the, uh, the MTA's uh, transit museum has actually been selling out tours for people to come and see the space. And uh, apparently the tours sell out in under 24 hours. There's a lot of interest in the space. Here's where this is within the city. Um, this is, the, on, on the, on the right-hand side, you can see the entrance to the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, this is on the Manhattan side. And the green overlay uh, on this Google map is the footprint of the space with the actual architectural drawings superimposed on top. Those uh, curvy lines, if you can make them out, uh, are the former rail lines, which are all still there, still intact. So one of the first things we did was uh, to confirm something that probably everybody feels on the Lower East Side, which is that it, it, it dramatically uh, is lacking in green space. Uh, the area that's bound by Lower East Side, East Village, and Chinatown um, has dramatically less green space than uh, New York City overall, and New York City, uh, as uh, compared to many other cities of similar density, is also lacking in green space. And this goes all the way back to the earliest days of Lower East Side. It's really been traditionally known as an immigrant uh, space, and here you can see really the, the, the main public space uh, in the earliest days of Lower East Side is, is really being directly in the street. Uh, this is a, a view of what the trolley terminals um, uh, streetscape actually was really all about. So here you can see in the center there are some head houses, and this was literally where people were going in and out of the, the trolley station below the surface of Delancey Street. And again, you can see um, the, the trolley cars above ground where people would sort of get up to the street level and then continue on their journey on, on trolley cars and keep going. So here we are in uh, uh, the 60s and 70s uh, with those groovy outfits down below. You can see some of the things that happened over the course of the, the century, slowly but surely. Much more asphalt, much more cars, um, a lot of traffic. And this is actually the area today. So for, for those of you who know this part of the Lower East Side, uh, on the right-hand side, there's a lot of public housing. Um, there's uh, this sort of pedestrian plaza, or this, this sort of wasted uh, plaza of asphalt, and a, an approach to the bridge that actually is very dangerous. Some of the most dangerous intersections in Manhattan uh, are really all around, all along this corridor. Uh, and so the question is then sort of what was the approach? How could you possibly think about uh, generating new, new uh, space in the city? Um, Finding a location like the former trolley terminal underground provides this question. Maybe it could be something really interesting. And how would we actually turn the space into something that could be appealing? So we think the answer, uh, as we, we said in the introduction, is technology. So for those of you who are uh, kind of far away from the screen, you can kind of see the basics of how this thing works. Uh, at a very high level, really what we're planning on doing is drawing sunlight to a solar collector at some distance from the street and then reflecting that light below the surface of the street using a system of optics. So really a system of mirrors to create the effect of the skylight. So we're calling this essentially a remote skylight. And what we've been able to do and test, and we'll talk about that a little bit, is uh, that not only can we actually deliver sunlight below the surface of the street, uh, there will be some, some attenuation, some diminishment of the light quality, but it will have a, a, a quantity of light and a, a quality of light that has full spectrum wavelength, which would allow for photosynthesis to occur, so you actually could have plants and trees uh, in the space. You can imagine the reuse of this space for a much more dynamic uh, purpose. 
This is an early mock-up that we uh, cobbled together with um, literally do dozens of components ordered from all over the world. Uh, and this is James, who regrettably couldn't be here tonight, uh, assembling this thing on the sidewalk of uh, right in front of our office uh, and pointing it directly to the sun. And you know, in this science experiment, we were able to actually deliver sunlight uh, indoors and uh, served as, a, a, as an important uh, case study before we even talked to anybody about it. We wanted to prove it to ourselves before we got any serious advisors on board. So then we said, okay, well, what happens when you introduce design uh, into the space? And uh, we took the, the drawings and, uh, and then had some fun with them and came up with this, which is one of the few renderings which we first published in 2011, New York Magazine actually wrote a really fun story on us, an intelligencer, and uh, uh, we sort of got our first bit of attention from that. Here's another rendering. Um, you can see that short shorts are a big part of Lula. Uh, <laughs> but you also get a sense, a, sort of a, a sketchy sense, of how we would integrate things like the uh, existing uh, rail lines and integrate green uh, into the space in a way that sort of both played homage to the, the history of uh, the columns and the, the cobblestones and the other rail lines that are there, uh, but also do something that's incredibly modern and, and new and, and, and design forward. So this is all great, but I think that the, the next few questions, which I'm sure some of you have thought about, and you know, I sort of call this the grandma test. It's like, uh, how will it really feel in this space, right? Will people actually want to go into it? How do we know that the low end would be an appealing place? Um, would people actually go to it, and what, why would they go multiple times? Would they just go once to see it, like an art exhibit, and how do you create a, sort of a dynamic space? Is it something that you could even build from a, from a technical standpoint? And then probably most importantly, in this era of declining money for you know, innovative projects, who will fund it? So first thing we did to start that last question, we went to a Kickstarter campaign, which some of you may have seen. Uh, and uh, to our surprise, we completely nailed it. We basically hit a very ambitious target of $100,000 on Kickstarter in the first week. And uh, we raised over $150,000, which is uh, still, well, it was at the time a public design uh, record using Kickstarter for a public design project. And we still actually hold the, uh, the, high, the, the record for the highest number of individual backers for a Kickstarter project in the public design category. So we took that money and immediately went to work uh, putting together a uh, installation to show people how this would actually look and feel, and to also, again, prove to ourselves at, at a higher level that technically this was possible. This is us in the warehouse on the Lower East Side, um, uh, working on assembling this thing. We uh, took over an abandoned warehouse and uh, installed a, uh, uh, a series of uh, solar collectors, blacked out the entire space, and hoisted it to the ceiling. This is a close-up, this is actual photograph of, not an architectural rendering, this is a photograph of the, uh, the components, um, literally hundreds of individual components hand-stitched together, uh, designed to, uh, to create a, um, a version of the, the actual canopy that we would be delivering. There in the center you can see um, the six hexagons that are actually delivering the sunlight via this uh, solar collector and uh, distribution package that we put together. And then you can see the reflective services down below. And then we installed a, a green space in order to actually show how the, uh, the plants and, and a, and a 10,000 pound Japanese maple would thrive underneath this lighting um, over a sustained period. Uh, and uh, you know, to, our, to our happiness and excitement, it actually went quite well. Uh, we also planted some ferns, mosses. This is an entirely live little green space in an otherwise entirely barren uh, warehouse. Um, and the tree actually, a, a praying mantis came with the tree and stayed and hung out the entire time. And we named it Zoltan. <laughs> so um, this was the, 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 uh, the beginning of what we call the Imagine in the Low Line exhibit. And uh, we opened up shop. Uh, we, it was free for, for the public to come. And uh, immediately we had over 11,000 people come to visit the exhibit in uh, just under two weeks. So people came to learn more about the project. We also sort of brought in a lot of local businesses uh, to sort of simulate a little bit of the kind of community we would want if we actually had access to a, a, a public space in the future. And we actually had a couple of street fairs, quote unquote, in, on, on, on sort of around the perimeter of our exhibit. Uh, and again, to our ha happiness and excitement, people not only came to the exhibit out of interest, but they stuck around and sort of enjoyed themselves while they were there. 
Um, and so it was, it was really an interesting sort of psychosocial experiment, which we were very happy with the results. A bunch of kids came to the exhibit, and we were kind of inspired by their excitement and their interest, both on the on the scientific side and uh, on the design side. So it's kind of a fun sort of segue into uh, what we've um, uh, what we've sort of done and sort of what we're doing moving forward. So one thing that, as I said, kids are um, are, are really a lot of fun to work with, but uh, I think more importantly and more interestingly, these kids. Uh, who live on the Lower East Side uh, know all of these things, all of these statistics and figures in a much more intuitive sense. So they know how much the Lower East Side needs green space. Um, they'll tell you things about how unsafe Delancey Street is. Uh, and they actually have amazing ideas and get to all the same questions that adults do, sometimes even faster. So what we've done is uh, launched a couple of programs to bring young people into the design process. Not necessarily designing solar technology devices, but thinking about the uses of the space and thinking about what would a young person and, their, and the people that they know in their community, including their families and friends, how would they use uh, a potential low-line space, a potential underground site? So all kinds of fun and, and crazy ideas. This is one of my favorites, which I guess involves mermaids and uh, fish, uh, which is probably not possible in the low-line, so that's, not, that's an idea that was great, but it's probably not something we're gonna be moving forward with. Um, but all kinds of really exciting ideas. Uh, you also get a sense that from kids, like, um, you know, the priority being um, swings, apparently. Um, it's amazing to me. I'm, I mean, uh, I, don't, I guess I don't spend enough time with middle school kids, but uh, how really important swings are to their, their happiness. Um, it comes up all the time. But a lot of really good ideas, too. And uh, I think the fun part about this is uh, really engaging with and, and looking for patterns and seeing what, uh, what the kids are are coming up with. It's also interesting because, I mean, as noted, this is a uh, project which, like the Highline, uh, is likely to take a very, very long time. So, you know, watch out for these kids because they're actually going to be a lot older by the time this thing happens. And most likely they'll be stakeholders uh, uh, in this park. And um, it's exciting to think about uh, their feeling that they had some small role in being a part of it. So the next big thing that we're doing uh, is we're engaging with a lot of small businesses in and around the Lower East Side. So, for those of you, I imagine you, a lot of you are, are Brooklynites, but uh, for those of you who know the Lower East Side, it's, it's known for its, its small business community, but also for its kind of fun nightlife community. And so what we're doing, we partner with Absolute, and this is kind of a fun thing, but um, uh, a lot of bars around the area have said, how can we help? So uh, what we've done is we've added this drink called the Absolute Low Line to menus, and then for every $1 of that uh, uh, drink that's sold, $1 comes to the, uh, the low line. So it's a, it's a kind of a great way for us to connect to the, you know, the small business owners that we know and, um, and getting sort of everyone a, a way to, to be involved in some small way. And uh, we also know we need to actually you know, go back and, and do, do a lot more research and a lot more work. So uh, our understanding of the technological approach has absolutely evolved over the course of the last couple of years. You can see the sort of DIY approach where we were you know, basically a couple of kits with, um, with some components that we ordered uh, online. Um, we, since then, have actually uh, really done quite a bit of research with uh, a lot of the team that helped make the Highline possibility, and I'll talk a little bit about that research and that analysis in, in a bit. Uh, but we also know how much we don't know and know that it's really important to kind of keep the technology research going. So a big part of 2014 for us will really be um, putting together uh, both a, a location and an approach, technological approach for a much more ambitious lab in which we'll actually install a new version of the technology, uh, a new green space, and uh, continue to test this over a longer period of time, uh, as well as uh, potentially being able to study the effects of the space on people in, um, in all four seasons and, uh, and really sort of enjoy a little bit more of a, a longitudinal study uh, that will uh, certainly inform the future park in a, in a, in a better way. So, as I said, we actually have done quite a bit of research, uh, and a lot of that research is incredibly uh, boring, and uh, you probably don't have time for it now. But what I thought I would do is just sort of share um, the, the core findings in the form of a manifesto. So sort of why is this important to us, or sort of, you know, if you've seen these, you know, fashion do's and don'ts, um, we've assembled some do's and don'ts for sort of, you know, how to create a, 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 a green park, and sort of what we stand for in terms of thinking about creating something underground. So first, I think really important uh, insight from our research is that uh, New York City has an almost infinite need for flexible third spaces. So if you have your home, you have your work, 
And then you need a third space. You need a place for recreation and for thinking and, um, and for meeting and socializing and all that. So uh, I think one of, my, one of the, my, my favorite things that I heard from a, uh, somebody that we met at the Department of Transportation once was, um, it's amazing how you can essentially put a bench on really anywhere in New York and it'll be used. Uh, you can put it literally on the most inhospitable corner and it's soaked up. It's kind of an amazing thing, a social thing to see. Um, and I think it's because we have this, this real limited um, uh, number of spaces that people can call their own and that they can um, really uh, build a bit of sense of community. So as for community, I think there's a lot of ways that we think we can specifically support community. Uh, and open space is one of them. Uh, I won't go into the details unless you're interested of the, uh, the political reality of what's happening on the Lower East Side right now. But you may have noticed that a uh, major contract was just awarded for a large scale development on the Lower East Side called Seward Park, uh, which essentially will take this entire area and dramatically transform it. Very large towers are going to those parking lots right there on the right, and, uh, and this whole space will be uh, dramatically changed quite a bit. And there's a lot of anxiety around this. I think what's interesting about this particular development in the city, and it's actually an interesting case study for large-scale development everywhere in New York City and maybe in other cities, uh, is that it, it calls for one and a half million square feet of redevelopment and roughly 10,000 square feet of public space. So you can see that you know in the, in the politics and in the, in the sausage grinding of, of, of the development process, the community very clearly articulated an interest in affordable housing, and that's a very, very important goal. Um, uh, but uh, sometimes, because land is, is very much a zero-sum game in New York City, that means that open space is limited. So what we think we can actually bring to the community is a much-needed um, additional 60,000 square feet, another new acre of open space. So the next thing is uh, supporting uh, transportation. So uh, this is one of, our, one of our school groups went down there, and I don't know if any of you ever spend any amazing time in the Delancey Essex subway station uh, this is the Jay-Z track, which actually just, just on the other side of this gets, it's kind of a funny photo because you can't see into the low line, but if the kids weren't there, you could see into the low line from this, from this image. And uh, uh, this is an incredibly dangerous subway platform. It's, uh, in some cases, uh, it isn't much bigger than this podium, uh, the amount of space you have to walk on, uh, separating you from the railing and the, uh, and the train itself. So uh, what we're proposing here is something that would not only be a public space, but would also provide a bit of, uh, of much needed community access to the existing subway station in a safe way. Uh, it also would create new entrances to the existing subway station so that it would reduce the number of times that people need to cross to Lancy Street in order to get to the subway station. And that would actually impact 200,000 people on the Lower East Side. Um, this is one of my favorite weird groups called Leslie and Elise. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, the, the point I think that we like to make here is that um, uh, there, this is an, an, an interesting evolution. I don't know if, if any of you are, are sort of gotten into um, raising money for any kind of cultural project. But there's a lot of money in, um, in the city and there's a lot of funding and spending and fundraising on, um, on uh, established art, but uh, sort of avant-garde and sort of new uh, creative and, uh, and younger, exper more experimental forms of art um, are often underfunded. So I think one of the things that has really resonated with us in engaging with the community is thinking about preserving the low line as a space that could be um, an experimental and exciting space for culture. So creating a sort of a new cultural hub where uh, we keep the space vibrant with a lot, of, uh, a lot of different kinds of programming and continue to give people an opportunity uh, artists and, and others in the community to perform or display work, but also a really exciting space where um, uh, unconventional things can happen. And what could be more unconven unconventional than showing your space, showing your art, or, or performing in an underground space? Um, so supporting the local community. People talk a lot about you know how to support small businesses. Uh, they talk about that at the city level and federal level, but. Uh, the Lower East Side actually is very fortunate in having a tremendous number of small businesses, some of whom have been actually around for over 100 years and have deep ties to the immigrant community, many of whom um, still live in and around the area. And so one of the things we're really proud of is the capacity for uh, a new cultural hub that would really support some of the businesses that are already there, potentially create new opportunities for small business owners to open. And uh, we, again, sort of the absolute low line is, is one of several projects which we're hoping to to build over the course of the next couple of years and ways to literally and, um, and clearly draw the small business community into the, the low end. 
So uh, do grow the economy. So the, the High Line, some of you um, uh, may, may know this, but the High Line has released some figures that uh, between real estate and, uh, and retail benefits, the, the west side of Manhattan has benefited to the tune of $2 billion. Uh, and uh, that's something that uh, you can actually just kind of see physically, you can feel it. Um, you know, the, the difference between the High Line uh, district, the new High Line district, sort of 15 years ago to today, uh, is really stunning and remarkable. So, the argument that public space um, uh, benefits the local economy, benefits the economy of the city overall, is something that I think um, the High Line might actually be, be one of the best symbols for that. So, we did the do's, so the don'ts. So don't abandon historic treasures. This some of you may, may recognize as the abandoned City Hall station, which uh, is simply unused because I guess the MTA has, has deemed it um, too, too difficult and challenging. Some of you may know more about this than I, um, uh, to use it as a, as a functioning uh, transit space. And uh, so you have a, a number of, uh, of examples throughout New York City history where uh, spaces that have been dug out underground that are actually quite stunning, and quite beautiful, have either not been preserved or have simply been destroyed. Uh, the Lowland site itself is uh, definitely the largest existing intact example of the streetcar era in New York City. And so we have an acre of almost untouched, it's like a piece of, um, uh, of amber, uh, this crystallized older space where the existing subway, um, sorry, excuse me, the, the existing cobblestones that were literally laid down in 1905, 1906 are all still there. All the rail lines are all still there. All the, the, the cross hatches on the columns and the uh, the corrugated ceilings with the actual catenary tracks, that's what the, the trolley cars were attached to, those are all s physically still there. It's like a, you know, it's like Pompeii or something. So this question of how do you actually take it, dust it off, um, make it magical again, it's something that I think is really important. Don't fear new technology. So solar technology, some of you may be in the, in the, in the solar technology space, uh, is often derided as too hard or not efficient. Photovoltaic is something that uh, there, there, there are a lot of limitations to what's possible with solar technology right now. Uh, but, and, and there's also a sense that, that, uh, that new technologies can sometimes be a, a bit too expensive and it's simply not worth it. I mean, why, why, why invest in a new technology when you can simply add some halogen lamps or, or whatever? Uh, I think uh, uh, this is something that, that is really worth exploration and uh, for all the lip service that we paid to invest in technology, here's a, uh, an idea that could have dramatic impact on New Yorkers' lives and potentially something that could scale elsewhere in the city and around the world. So don't accept crappy public design. This is uh, Penn Station. Uh, it might not even be on a holiday weekend. It might just be sort of any old day if you guys have ever been there. Um, it's unbelievably miserable and claustrophobic. And uh, New Yorkers are used to this kind of stuff. They're completely used to they just deal with it, right? Penn Station is just a bad place to go. And some of you may know that you know Penn Station. Uh, there, there are some efforts right now. I mean, this large society is leading an effort to um, take advantage of the fact that Penn Station's lease will be up in several years, and that it is actually possible uh, to imagine uh, entirely new design on that site. Uh, but I, I think that sort of the larger point here is that is that in order to have greater public design, you need uh, to advocate for it and you need to, to, to promote it when it's possible. This is Penn Station, um, I believe in the 40s. Uh, just as a frame of reference, I mean, I'm sure, I don't know if any of you were there, uh, I'm presuming not, but I mean, it's, it's this stunning, stunning, stunning space, it's soaring architecture and design, and it was a real marvel at the time, and it made people feel uh, tremendous in going there, but it was ambitious and expensive. Uh, and uh, you know, let's just go back to where we are today. Right? <laughs> so I think uh, it's 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 it needs to be in sort of a larger conversation of saying yes, this might be an expensive project, which um, uh, again is all relative, uh, but it's a, sort of an important thing to, to think about that. So what we're really promoting here is not missing a chance to design for the future. And here actually is our uh, one of our latest renderings. I don't know if you can kind of see what's there. You have two women sort of walking along, wearing winter coats. You have uh, an entrance to the space that basically peels up the, the sidewalk, so uh, you can actually see the layers of the city uh, in that in that uh, in that opening, and it invites you down into the space. It could also be designed in a way that could be incredibly resilient in the face of um, of, of storms or climate change. It could be a space that would actually be a favorite space on a, on a freezing winter day when you don't want to go to the High Line and you don't want to go to Central Park or Prospect Park. Uh, 
So thinking about this almost as the, the anti-park, the sort of the opposite of uh, what we think about right now in parks, and, and also imagining it uh, as a space that would not be um, uh, vulnerable to storms on, the, on, our, on our riverfronts and, uh, and in spaces that are outdoors. So uh, uh, I'll leave you with, uh, with that thought and with that image, and I'm more than happy to take any questions from my head. about light and noise. First, it's obviously it's on the entrance to the bridge, as what studies have been done about the fact that 18 wheelers are going over this zone. Is, is that gonna be, can you hear that? And then the other noise obviously is when you said it's open to where the JMZ passes through, are you gonna be able to, are you gonna just hear trains every 30 seconds or two minutes? And then about the light, what happens on days where it's overcast and awful, and what about at night? Okay, um, all right, thanks for, for all those questions. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll take the, the question of acoustics first, and I'll preface all of this with um, uh, uh, the fact that we have an incredible partner uh, who is working with us called uh, Eric, it's an engineering firm, some of you may know, who um, has done things like actually build the Sydney Opera House and is building the Second Avenue subway right now and has extensive experience uh, with the MTA and with the New York City's underground system. So. Uh, they have an entire team that is devoted only to acoustics, and they, and for our initial feasibility report, uh, did quite a bit of analysis on exactly that question, right? So how do we keep it um, um, safe from the sound that's coming from the subway station, which is right there, um, and also uh, sort of other sounds that are nearby, including the bridge. So uh, what we envision as part of the design, and we have these in some images and some renderings, which we'll be releasing actually very shortly, uh, is the erection of a, uh, an actual separating barrier, sort of a, a wall between the existing subway and the, uh, the actual park itself. Now, this presents a really interesting set of design opportunities and challenges. So imagining a, a barrier, as, as you saw, uh, if you're on the subway platform currently, you can look right over the tracks into the existing subway line. So the vision at this point is to imagine an opaque or an almost entirely transparent wall uh, that would almost serve as a window from uh, the park goers watching the subway roar by, which is sort of quintessential New York experience. Um, so see the subway but not hear it and, and not need to worry about steel dust coming from the subway into the park. Um, and, and also that subway passengers would be able to experience and sort of, you know, sort of a, a shooting by sort of a nice green uh, space in, in, the, in, in, the, um, in the station as they're, as they're roaring past. So the acoustics is definitely something that will require uh, a separation barrier to, to, to solve that first problem, and then a larger acoustics treatment, which uh, we're working directly with Arabon for the, for the next stages of final design. So your next question was about light. And uh, the question was really around, okay, well, what happens when it's cloudy or dark out and, uh, yeah, or it's winter and at 4.30 4 it's, it's, it's pitch black. So yeah, I think, and this was really how we designed, this was a really fun part of our technology exhibit, was um, we actually included supplementary lighting so that you actually could turn it up and turn down the additional lighting. So you can use the space at night, and you can, you can turn the space into something that is, is really magical and exciting. You play off of all the same design elements, the fact that there's a green light from the space, all of it will really feel very exciting and magical. Um, it, the lighting, obviously, you can't manufacture um, daylight during, um, during that time. So, we would, we would simply have a different level of glow and a different kind of feel um, at that time. Just a follow-up question on that. With the, with the clear wall, which is, sounds beautiful, going for the window to be able to see on both sides, how will you, so the people on the subway side, when we always have all this graffiti and dirt and all that, if you have this window, how will you uh, deal with it getting dirty or things like that as it gets older? Because that is something that Yeah, so yeah, so great question about uh, uh, keeping uh, the separation barrier clean and thinking about graffiti and all that. So, you know, a couple of things uh, uh, on that front. Uh, the, the High Line is a, a great uh, example of a, a public space where there's a lot of anxiety about what was going to happen in that environment. You know, were people going to re tag? You know, they, the, the, the High Line designers um, um, decided. Uh, 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 sort of along the way that, uh, that no graffiti could be included in the final design uh, and that you know there was a zero tolerance policy for graffiti 
Um, and there was a real concern and anxiety around what would happen, right? No one knew what was going to happen to the Highland when, when they opened. And uh, I mean, the amazing thing about the Highland's experience is that at this at this point, you know, uh, vandalism has been uh, extremely limited, and uh, security concerns also have not really been um, anything close to an issue. Uh, so uh, we get it that we're in the Lower East Side, <laughs> totally different neighborhood from um, from the Far West Side. Uh, and so acknowledging that there is the possibility of um, of uh, some mischievous spray can, you know, spray can wielders. Uh, I think uh, part of the answer to that is in design and in material selection. So uh, really building with materials that are cleanable and uh, and are designed for uh, the ability to uh, to sort of maintain and upkeep the space. Um, it's it bears. Noting also that the, the High Lines maintenance budget or any public spaces maintenance budget, um, not any public space, but well run public spaces in New York City, uh, uh, really spend a lot of money and a lot of time on both preventing those kinds of acts as well as um, remediating them as soon as possible. And uh, I think to, in, to, to a grand extent that some of those answers can be solved by our, um, our operation plan once we're open. So a great question about uh, the effects of, of, uh, of Superstorm Sandy and, and uh, what's coming in the future, how it can be safe. So uh, the experience with, with Superstorm Sandy was that uh, the, the actual site where the lowland is located is actually on, on relatively high uh, elevated land. So it's actually not really that close to the East River. Um, and the amazing thing about, one of the amazing lessons from Superstorm Sandy is that the, the flooding was almost entirely predictable, and it was predictable along the 500-year flood line, which uh, Eric, our engineering firm, actually uh, built for the MTA. And so all of the subways and all of the uh, underground tunnels that flooded were well within that 500-year flood line. And if you look on a map of where that, where that, uh, that flood line reaches, it's, it's actually uh, not really anywhere near, near to the land site. So this subway station, the Delancey Essex subway station, was one of the first to reopen after Sandy, um, just a few days after the storm. Uh, and um, and so there wasn't, I mean, I think, I think the fact that this site is still in existence after probably 70 years of neglect is a sign that it, it probably is a pretty resilient space. Um, so that's, that's what we're thinking. I think the other side of this in, in terms of planning is um, that Again, a lot of the vulnerability that uh, that we face in, uh, in in New York City's infrastructure is also due to a lack of planning, a lack of planning around materials, and a lack of planning around um, safeguards for, uh, for for the most vulnerable spaces. Uh, so, uh, in this case, we imagine the possibility of, of a wide variety of materials and um, safety mechanisms, so that uh, in the face of a big storm. Uh, water is less likely to actually permeate into the space. Um, it's also possible to design uh, the actual uh, uh, ground and the actual um, uh, sort of layout of the space, the, from the selection of the plant life to the materials that are used in the ground uh, to the, uh, the bedrock below that, uh, to think about filtration systems that uh, will allow, in the very worst case scenario, uh, for the space to bounce back and for the space to be a resilient site. So I think that's something that, it's an, an interesting thing here, I mean, the last thing that I would ever say is that, you know, um, you know, all of our parks are at risk, but it is true that we've invested heavily in coastal parks over the course of the last several years, and um, some of those spaces are much more vulnerable than anything that could be underground, uh, and that the underground system is something that might actually serve as a uh, symbol and as a, as, as a real uh, potential area in which public spaces and spaces in general can be kept more safe in the face of the storm, simply because they're underground and, and therefore protectable. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask, it seems like you're saying you found the site in 2010 and you've been working, uh, you mentioned some feasibility reports that you've been getting at. And so I kind of would like to know a little bit 
like how far along on that process do you think you are? What are kind of the big, the big issues that you're looking at in this coming year? And <coughs> have you even gotten to a point yet where you could say, someone would write me a blank check, this is how many millions of dollars I need? Um, or are we still like many years off from that? Yeah, so um, so if you have millions of dollars, I'm accepting them tonight, actually. <laughs> I, need, I, need, I need an exact budget. Of okay. <laughs> Well, actually, I'm glad you asked. I can get you the exact budget, um, or the, the projected budget. So uh, I mentioned the feasibility report that we did with, um, with Eric, and that was an entirely technical study. It's an engineering study, um, you know, specifically focused on things like acoustics and lighting and uh, you know, sanitation and so on. We also separately did a feasibility report that is entirely around business planning, uh, cost estimates, and um, uh, the political realities. And that, that report was done by HRNA. Uh, some of you may know that firm. Um, they actually advised the Highline from, from soup to nuts. They actually first made the keys to City Hall that the Highline was worth investing in. And they uh, have measured the impact of the Highline um, in the years since it's been open. So, uh, and they've, they have experience with this in many other cities around the world as well. So we're thinking about how you convert these kinds of spaces. So um, between these two teams, we came up with an estimate of roughly $60 million. And uh, uh, that's a number that I, I actually have a ton of confidence in. It has um, um, some pretty robust analysis behind. But of course, these things can shift with uh, a, 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 you know, a ton of other factors, including the technology used, including what's above ground, including um, uh, cooperation with other agencies and, and other ways that we might be able to get in kind of funding. Um, so you can ask also about sort of where we're going, kind of uh, sort of how far off we are from this. So. You know, we've done the um, you know these two reports, which really serve to uh, to show both you know to, to the city and to a lot of our uh, individual backers, um, individual donors, uh, foundations, corporate supporters, uh, and others who are, who are rallying behind the project. Um, but uh, we recognize that the next few steps are are simply for us to take the tremendous amount of political support that we have, the, the community support that we have. Um, one thing I left out of our presentation is that. This summer, we have all nine of the elected officials that represent the Lower East Side, from the city, state, and federal level, you know, up to Schumer and Gillibrand, uh, writing a letter to City Hall requesting that the project move forward in the interest of the Lower East Side. Um, I think uh, the next step is for us to sort of take all of that support and simply engage with the legal reality of how the low line can become um, a public space. So right now, it's operated under the MTA's master lease. It might be more, more um, technical than anybody wants to hear. Um, but it's, it's part of the MTA's mass release for the city. And uh, our, our uh, focus right now is to take um, this particular um, uh, tract of, of land, uh, remove it from the MTA's mass release, and transfer it to, uh, to the city so that we can partner with the city agency in creating a public space. That's exactly the, um, uh, the process that the Highline followed. And uh, the Highline is now under the jurisdiction of the Parks Department. We may be under the Parks Department, we might be under a different city agency. But the plan is really to, um, we can't really, uh, since the MTA is not in the business of uh, public spaces or um, um, thinking about um, uh, public uses outside of transport, I think you know, we need a partner that actually is in the business of thinking about new public spaces. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I had couple of different questions. Uh, one of them was about the, the technology for, uh, for the solar collector. Uh, I think that the, one of the initial renderings that you showed uh, showed you know, some type of mushroom thing above ground that was collecting the light you know, and then transferring it underground. Uh, so is that still the idea? Because it, I mean, I've been to this particular spot. It's paved over with uh, roads that cars enjoy using. Um, where are those, you know, where are the above ground structures going to be located? And uh, will the below ground portions of them look as psychedelic and trippy as the reflective surfaces did on one of your, one or two of the, uh, the renderings? Or are they going to look more like the hex, hexagonal designs that you've, that you've been actually mocking up and, and deploying so far? Yeah, okay, so let's see. The first question is uh, about the, uh, the placement of sort of what's happening above ground, second is about below ground sort of design. So, um, you know, uh, above ground, uh, all that's really needed is a place for us to uh, be able to, and I say all that's needed, but it's actually quite difficult 
is a place where you can track the sun throughout the, its entire course through the sky during, during an individual day. So in order to, to assess where we can actually uh, place those, we, we did uh, some pretty robust shadow studies, um, knowing, knowing the, the, the buildings that are in the area. And that indicated that the best place for that is really on the north side of Delancey Street. So there actually are some spaces. There's both, um, uh, if you know Delancey Street, there's a, a median in the middle of the street. Uh, and then there's on the north side of the street uh, some, some areas where it's possible to collect sunlight throughout the day. It's simply the way that the, the street and the buildings and the sun interact. So the best place is to put these collectors on the north side of the street. And then we would, we would simply uh, draw the sunlight um, you know, via fiber optics. One of the beauties of fiber optics is that, um, in theory, theoretically, you could uh, extend a fiber optic a very, very long distance and still transmit that signal, and still transmit that light. And, uh, and so that's, that's really the plan uh, in terms of where the solar collectors above the surface of the street will be located. Again, that, this is another entirely exciting category of design if you really think about what's possible at the street level. Uh, you know, imagining, these, as you put it, these sort of upside down mushrooms or right side up mushrooms, depending on the mushroom. Uh, they also could be seen as street furniture that has multiple uses and actually is valuable. So, uh, umbrellas or bike stations or something that I think the city should actually have, which is cell phone charging stations, or actually having things that are valuable and useful, um, uh, but that also uh, at their very top are actually collecting sunlight throughout the day and filtering it below. So as for the final design uh, below the surface of the street, the uh, you know we basically created the hexagonal shapes uh, for uh, really out of. Um, out of, a, out of necessity, you know, we had, as you saw, we had $150,000, in fact, we had less than, we had $120,000 to build a, a version of a $60 million park. So what we did was we sort of did something that was much more cost effective, which was to sort of simulate the feel of a, um, a concave internal reflective uh, uh, surface. I think uh, in the final design and some of the new renderings that we'll be releasing fairly shortly, uh, you'll continue to see that same uh, design aesthetic of a almost a sort of a liquid ceiling where you have uh, the ability to kind of reflect the green that is below the surface. You know, it, it, it's basically on the on the ground level, um, and again, make the most of the fact that it's underground. Um, so rather than a really dark uh, ceiling, you have this sort of reflective light, bright space, and um, and then creating this um, almost a sort of a, a, a bit of an ecosphere. That's the Keeping with the ecosphere, I'm imagining a fountain down there. That sounds great. That sounds great. We should definitely, we should definitely explore that. I think um, water elements are something that comes up a lot, and the kids actually love, as you saw, the mermaid um, vision. Uh, I mean, I think uh, we are certainly several phases away from any kind of final design considerations like that. Um, I think what we're really working toward right now is saying, we want to preserve the space, we want to preserve the history, and we want to uh, to draw sunlight underground and have green stuff. Uh, we also want it to be used for the public in a flexible way. We're not, we don't want to commit to it being a, a mall or uh, simply something that is a, a walkway for transport. Um, and then outside of that, you can have a ton of fun with the design. There's a lot of really fun dimensions of that. Um, we There's one thing I didn't share with you is the actual dimensions of the space make for sort of one common area where you could have, you can imagine, sort of larger events. Um, so in that design concept, we could have uh, actually the creation of probably the most important um, uh, event venue rental opportunity within the neighborhood, roughly 10,000 square foot space, uh, or it's sort of up to 15,000 square foot space. And then another area that's a little bit more whimsical where it's simply just plants and, and trees and uh, calling it the ramble, sort of in, in, a, in, a, in a nod to, to Central Park. Uh, so I think there's, there's a, lot of really, a lot of fun to be had, and maybe a fountain will, will make the final design. I'll send you a design. Okay, I'd love to see it, thanks. So I noticed that you, you have that absolute thing, and you were doing a speakeasy, and there's a couple other events that you guys are handling. <clears throat> Naturally, they're not going to make you $60 million. So is it more to build up relations and keep you relevant, or is it more of just for like the... Yeah, extending the runway until you get the big check. And then also, um, you talked about that warehouse. Are you still using it? Um, do you have are you able to use the actual space for events in the meantime? Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's see, a couple questions. Um, uh, your first question is about fundraising. So, uh, yeah, you may have noted that we are um, 
throwing a very cool party in a couple weeks, which I encourage you all to think about attending. We're doing it at Speakeasy in, a, um, in actually New York City's oldest former synagogue in the 1840s. Um, this thing was built as a former synagogue, and now it's an event space on Norfolk Street, just south of Houston. And uh, it's called the Orange Sand Space. And, uh, and so we're sort of um, having a lot of fun with the history of, of that site, and it is also an opportunity to raise money. But you know, the tickets, while more, more expensive than, than two dollars, it's a you know one hundred fifty dollar ticket. Um, that doesn't get you all the way to sixty million, right? So um, you know, I think that, I, again, I mean, um, we're not copying everything that Highland's doing, but the Highland's <laughs> a really, a really good example of extremely scrappy planning that led to tremendous capacity for private fundraising, both on the public side and the private side. So um, we're modeling ourselves in many ways off of fundraising uh, uh, a plan at the Highline and, and many other innovative spaces in the city like Bryant Park and, and others have followed. So thinking about a really diverse mix, we're, we're set up as a not-for-profit organization so we can accept, accept tax deductible donations. Um, the mix of funding will certainly come from some, some public sources at the city, state, and federal level from corporate supporters who are interested and excited about sponsoring opportunities along the way. Absolutely, it's one example. Uh, foundation support for technology innovation um, and for a lot of our community-related programming. Uh, and, and individuals. And so, you know, we know there's some famous stories of individuals uh, getting behind uh, the Highline and Central Park in recent years uh, with tremendous, tremendous capacity. And, uh, I think this actually presents a tremendous opportunity for uh, philanthropists in New York City to actually make their mark on the city while they're still alive and while they have all of their millions. Uh, I think it's, a, it's an exciting opportunity for, um, for funders in the corporate space and the foundation space who are looking to really make a difference and, uh, and actually have uh, a, a truly innovative approach to, um, to, 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 to a problem. So I think um, our funding model is, to sum it up, is a, a diverse one. And, um, it's not just it's not just fun parties that we're, we're we're doing other stuff too. Uh, and your second question? Uh, are you do you have access to the actual space? Are you using yeah. that warehouse? So as I mentioned, the MTA still operates the site, and the MTA is not um, the easiest partner to work with when coordinating uh, uh, public events. Uh, so it's very very hard to get the space right now. Uh, we're hoping uh, again in the next few months to to sort out the legal status of the space, and we might have more access to the space in, in the, hopefully within the next six months. Uh, the warehouse that, uh, where we, in, in which we did the exhibit is immediately above the Lowland site. It's on the corner of Delancey and Essex. It's, a, it's an old, um, it's an, actually an old market building, and also has been abandoned for years, also city-owned land, um, and actually is also part of the redevelopment of the Lower East Side that I had mentioned earlier. So that site has just been, um, been purchased as part of that uh, that recent development award contract. Uh, our hope is that we'll be able to use that uh, that site again, at least for an event, uh, before it gets ripped down at the end of the year. And uh, for the Lowland Lab and the future of, of really how we'll be um, um, showcasing our, our technology and design, which is definitely a top priority for us in 2014, we have some pretty exciting opportunities, both at the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, and other spaces around the sort of broader New York City area. And hopefully in the next few months, we'll have something very exciting to announce. That's sort of where we'll be uh, building the next version of the, the low line technology. Uh, Definitely, yeah. So, so the question of the ecosystem, sort of how, how could we potentially be part of uh, and build something that, that could connect to the overall area and, and improve the overall area. I think uh, we have a, a historic opportunity with this new redevelopment of the, of, um, of the Lower East Side, the Seward Park or Urban Renewal Area. And uh, one of the exciting and encouraging things about this is that the, uh, the plan that actually won for the redevelopment of this land uh, incorporated and integrated very well with the actual presumptive future of the line. So, um, thinking about all of the ways that the low line could actually really help deliver um, uh, a ton of value to the overall area. So as I mentioned, the, the plan for this neighborhood involves one and a half million square feet of new redevelopment um, on nine different parcels. It's a mix of affordable housing and market rate housing. There's commercial um, real estate, um, some one or two big box uh, vendors, and a minuscule amount of public space. Uh, and so, uh, an exciting thing about, I think I'm actually very excited about the design that has been accepted and, and, and won this RFP, 
um, is uh, that it actually involves some pretty clever sort of underground snaking tunnels that integrate um, uh, and pull sort of uh, Delancey Street to Broom Street just to its south. So almost imagining a corridor underneath the entire city block, as well as really smart integration to the actual subway station. Um, real value added for the presumptive new Essex market. I probably know way too much about this area. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, you know, sorry. Um, but basically, the, uh, uh, there's a, a lot of very important uh, community gathering spaces in and around the area. And I think this new redesign really has the potential to integrate the low line into some of that, um, that new vision for a much better integrated area. Yeah, so I mean, this question of security comes up all the time. I think it's it's it's, it's definitely the most important thing. Again, it, uh, what's great about working with kids is that that's almost the first thing that comes up. Um, kids say, you know, they don't want hobos or however they're saying it uh, in the space or weapon, um, and it's essential, right? It's essential to a space being vibrant. Um, I think there's a couple of ways to mitigate and manage that. The first is thinking about having the space be open and closed during certain hours of the day, um, uh, maintaining a the High Line and other spaces have either park rangers or maintenance workers um, as an almost regular presence. Um, and so I think one of the ways to think about the Low Line site is, especially given the fact that it is underground, it's connected to an existing and actually really critical transit hub, um, and uh, requires entrance and egress, uh, it will be really uh, important and essential for us to have um, limits and access to the flow uh, within the space. So I think uh, more of the space is almost a um, a, sort of a, a, a gallery in which you can actually manage and maintain your hours and a sort of cultural institution in which you don't feel unsafe. You feel that it's in a beautiful cultural environment and, uh, and you're there to learn and to, uh, to enjoy your time. Um, so I have a question about the technology of these solar collectors because to me that seems like a major thing. If you can't light the area naturally, then it's not really a park, it's just like a warehouse essentially. So like you, you had like your initial prototype and you had your first, I guess, model after Kickstarter. So I guess like, where, where is that technology now? Like what, what do you see are things or problems you need to solve until you like, you know, check this part is completely ready to go? Uh, so I guess your, your, your question is about the, the, the sort of the, the process of technology, sort of where we are with uh, the, the design of the technology. Right, and like what's, what's, what's missing? Like what, what do you need to your dream. Okay, yeah, so I mean the central challenge with, uh, with our approach is that there's a number of challenges, right? Um, and all of them, I think, uh, require fine tuning. That's why we're really excited about actually getting into a lab environment to do this. Uh, one major technology challenge is how you collect sunlight and how you collect sun sunlight uh, in, the, in the optimal and most efficient way. Uh, and tracking the sun is actually a very difficult thing to do, especially if you think about the fact that it changes every day. Um, and you know, it's arc in the sky, and uh, uh, there's a lot of other factors, like how cloudy it is. So uh, there, are, there are a lot of challenges associated with that. So you need a really, really, really good tracking mechanism, and that's always been one of the central challenges for us. We actually have found a couple of technology partners that make some of those components that we're actually really, really excited about partnering with. Uh, and uh, so this is a great example of how our, our, our vision is evolving. We, we used one um, set of components for our exhibit in uh, last September, and we have an entirely new partner that we're planning on debuting for sort of the next version of this. Uh, another key consideration and a really important question is the, um, uh, the distribution mechanism. So uh, in, our, in our planning, we're, we're, we're thinking about using fiber optics or system of optics. And there's really expensive fiber, there's really uh, inexpensive fiber. Um, there's fiber where it could be so efficient that it could burn things. Um, there's fiber that uh, uh, would be so dull it would work. So I think it's really exciting, um, again, to, to play with different kinds of materials and to do this again in a laboratory environment. We recently had a, um, a very fun meeting, again, with <laughs> one of the teams behind, um, behind the Highline who were also advising us. And uh, they said, listen, it's so rare that you actually have in real life I don't know if any of you are designers or architects, um, the opportunity to actually uh, test something before it's built. I mean, very often you just, you have to, you have to figure it out on the fly and you have to just build it. 
um, some interesting things that uh, that you know we, we were recently in London giving uh, a, a talk there and actually exploring potential sites in London for a, a little while. I mean, there's a lot of um, spaces around the world where we, we might be able to deploy this. Um, but in London, I don't know if you've been following this, but there's this building that a, a designer um, uh, built that um, actually reflects sunlight down onto the street at such an intensity that they've actually been burning cars. Um, <laughs> so this this, uh, uh, this this one architect is under, under a lot of fire for that. But that's a great example where you have, um, you know, you build and then sometimes you, you think of, you, you know, you learn about what happens after a very expensive design has been built. And here, I think what we're proposing is to actually really treat it like a lab, to really be modest and humble and say, listen, we, we haven't so, so solved every problem yet, um, but we want this to be in sort of an open laboratory where people can see inside the process a little bit. So light and it being green is sort of this huge part of this that was there since the beginning. Is there a version of this that doesn't have that and that still has the green underground? I know that people have used light underground to grow plants in the past. Is there a version of this where you don't need to sort of engineer this new light system? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, sort of, you know, uh, many of you may have, may have grown some illicit plants in college with uh, 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 lighting that is definitely not natural. Um, I think, uh, yes, it's absolutely possible. This is, again, one of the things we could point back to people say, well, you know, is it possible to actually have plants um, in an environment where you don't have natural sunlight? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it is actually possible. Uh, there are some plants that actually thrive or like a uh, limited amount of light. Um, this is another really, really fun, I think, really fun design challenge, is what are the species and the varietals of plants that actually enjoy light that is not 100% um, of um, uh, sort of surface level uh, sunlight. So if you think about uh, a rainforest and the, the, the sort of a really um, lush canopy, and all of the many species of plants that are sort of below the surface of, um, of, of actually gaining access directly to sunlight, um, you can you can start to think about all of the many species that might like this kind of environment and, and really thrive. Uh, so again, I think the low line lab is a really fun way for us to explore some of that. Um, for those of you who know the Brooklyn Navy Yard, if you guys haven't been to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, you should go. It's a very, very cool sort of innovation hub, and I love going there. But one of the <laughs> great things about the Brooklyn Navy Yard is they have um, a, a rooftop farm called the Brooklyn Grange, which also has another location in Queens. Uh, and, uh, um, in talking with them, we said, okay, well, what, what would be the possibility of uh, experimenting with uh, edibles, with plants that actually you could eat? Um, what if some of our kids in the neighborhood actually planted some small crop that they could actually grow underground? Um, you know, it's, it's science fiction, but it's, it's really exciting to think about. Um, and, and these are the kinds of questions that I think animate, animate the project and keep it very, very fun. One of the key aspects that you spoke about was the fact that land is at a premium in New York. You're talking about capturing light using um, charging stations and, and bike stops or bus stops. Um, but the problem is, is that there's constant development and there are going to be buildings going up in all likelihood that at some point are going to block that. So that's the first question. The second question has to do with have you looked at, um, on the fundraising side, looking at projects like um, our very own Brooklyn Bridge Park, which the maintenance is funded in large part by two large buildings, um, one Brooklyn Bridge Park and the new one that's going up by Toll Brothers um, uh, at Pier 1. Um, and, and that way it becomes a, a public-private sort of enterprise. Yeah, great. So um, to, to, to weave those two questions together, um, I think the uh, uh, the development community is essential for us in, as, a, as a potential partner. So you know, again, we're sort of um, looking at the, the team that's coming in to make these tremendous changes to the overall neighborhood and partnering with them, hopefully in a way that says, uh, you know, the little end will actually be an asset not only for the community, not only for the city, uh, but actually for the investors who are actually building right above it. Um, it sort of increases the excitement of this um, of this land and um, certainly thinking about the, um, the the buildings as you put it that will be right uh, above frankly the low land site um, it makes more sense to integrate in a meaningful way so that it is part of the ecosystem that we'd like to to see it overall um, 
I think uh, the the fear or the the, the um, concern you raised around you know there's constantly development and uh, you could have uh, buildings overshadow this. Uh, we uh, one, one relatively good thing about um, uh, development in the city is that um, you can't constantly rezone uh, neighborhoods, and uh, zoning is necessary in order to build uh, large scale buildings. And so the Lower East Side has actually gone through a wave of zoning um, uh, several years ago. And this represents, this is why this is such an exciting uh, redevelopment plot, is that um, there aren't a ton of neighborhoods in the city that, um, that can, that, that aren't, uh, excuse me, that are slated um, for, uh, for large scale rezoning. And so uh, in our neighborhood in the Lower East Side and, and around this area, the, uh, the land is, it's, it's pretty clear how, what the height of buildings will be, at least for the next several decades, at least. Um, and the other, the other fun thing to imagine is that, in theory, again, one as I mentioned, uh, one could put a collector of um, uh, the, the kind that we're designing here onto the roof of a 20, 30 story building and um, uh, direct that light, again, using a system of optics, down the surface of that building into the site. So um, there's a scenario in which, and this is maybe in sort of advanced low line 4.0, um, in which you have a solar collector on the top of a skyscraper or a, a multi-story building, um, and you thread the, um, the distribution mechanism through the building and uh, actually uh, eliminate the basement of that building. I was wondering what proposals there are to uh, ventilate the space. I mean, uh, subway platforms can get stuffy uh, in the, uh, you know, the summer and kind of Certain times of the year, would it be artificial ventilation, or would it be just passive ventilation through the entrances? Or yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, uh, how we're planning on ventilating the space, we're, we're definitely planning um, to massively upgrade uh, anything that you've experienced in the New York State subway <laughs> station. Uh, so uh, I think the uh, it's uh, the, the more likely way to think about it is um, if you've been to the Apple Store on. Um, uh, on, on 60th Street, right near Central Park, there's you know, the majority. I mean, in fact, that space is daylight, right? You have um, a, a massive glass cube through which sunlight comes, and um, the majority of that space actually is illuminated by daylight. You guys know what I'm talking about that, that Apple Store, um, and that underground space um, uh, uh, has proper ventilation because it's properly built and properly designed. <laughs> Um, I think the subway system, um, for a long list of reasons, does not have adequate ventilation in all of its stations. Um, and we're looking to keep a space that would have the highest standards of comfort. Um, so we definitely will build a sort of modern ventilation system. My question that I, that I almost asked was sort of, uh, you kind of addressed it with the observation that these kinds of collectors could be used uh, to daylight the basements of the buildings in the vicinity. Have you guys thought at all about maybe licensing the technology in other situations? Because it strikes me that uh, on en in energy budgets, uh, in certain situations, you could actually save a lot of money by doing something like this. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, so, so you're, you're implying I, we, we could actually make some money on this? <laughs> well, why not be crazy? Um, why would I ever do that? Um, no, I think. Um, uh, that is something that has definitely occurred to us. I think the uh, the potential for this is definitely well beyond just a uh, the, the, this one particular small space um, uh, and this one particular use. You could imagine this being something that could be used in, in hospitals, um, in schools, in um, in, in um, uh, offices, uh, anywhere where natural sunlight is is lacking. And uh, and so this is something that I think we definitely are really excited about. Um, thinking about how much of this we actually could license, frankly. Um, we're, we're working on patents for uh, the technology, but the interesting thing about this is this has changed so many times that it's almost like, you know, we, have, we actually have four different versions of this so far, um, and it probably will evolve quite a bit on, you know, before we're actually um, built. So the question is sort of how much can we license this? Um, and the constant fear that somebody in China is doing it faster <laughs> will sort of, uh, it'll happen in, you know, overnight somewhere, right? Um, uh, but that is something that definitely is, is exciting to us, is thinking about how we can um, marry our particular technological approach as well as a design approach. Because I think a big, side, a big piece of this is some of these components of this technology actually do exist in, in commercial applications already. So um, 
you know, there's a couple of products that you can, you can go to Home Depot and get a, um, um, uh, like, Sunlight Direct. And, you know, there, there's, there's a couple of examples where you, if you wanted to um, sort of have a, um, some sunlight come into your, your bathroom, you actually could install this. But basically, there's, there's a company called Solar Tube, where it's basically a tube that goes from, you know, your roof to your, to your bathroom or whatever. Um, so incredibly unsexy applications of the same idea, you know, of simply saying, how do, how, do, how do you produce a remote skylight? How do you draw sunlight somewhere where you don't have that direct access to the sky? Um, and uh, I think what we're talking about is, and there's also examples, by the way, of, of uh, laboratories that are using this technology to grow algae, algae in controlled uh, settings. So in the technology, again, <laughs> the theoretical uh, level completely works, and um, you talk to the right scientists, and um, it is definitely something that is doable. The question is, uh, uh, that we're, I think, hoping to, to answer here is what happens when you uh, introduce new, uh, more, much more ambitious levels of design and uh, marry the technology with, uh, with elements of design that, uh, in this case, have a, a public or civic orientation, but also um, uh, just sort of uh, answer the question of uh, creating something beautiful as well as just actually a device that works. Being in Brooklyn Law, thinking about the, uh, the legal side of things, um, both from an IP perspective, I was thinking more in fundraising. I guess I was curious uh, what what legal obstacles you might be faced or anticipate facing, or you know what stage of the process are you where you're really you know thinking through the legal side of things and how you're going to build the structure um, beyond that legal structure. Sure. So you know on the on the, the legal side, certainly the IP is is front and center. That's, you know we've already identified that. It's an important question for us. Um, uh, you know, it's possible that, for example, a developer in the city could take this concept and um, and sort of use it uh, in some <laughs> kind of way. And, um, you know, sort of the low land brand is something that we, you know, itself is sort of a, sort of a legal question, sort of an interesting set of IP of, you know, how, to what extent do we own the concept of creating something like this underground? Um, another important uh, uh, set of legal questions surround uh, access to the site, sort of who owns it, who doesn't. This is actually really interesting. I mean, the site itself was, was built in 1908. It was abandoned in 1948. Um, and the MTA inherited the site. So what does this mean for its legal jurisdiction? Um, the master lease, there's, there's nothing on paper that anybody can find. No one at the MTA knows anything about the site. We actually informed the MTA of the site when we met, when we met with them, or at least with the, the, the real estate leadership that we met with when we were there. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, the question uh, from a legal standpoint of how it transfers from MTA jurisdiction to city jurisdiction uh, will require some very smart lawyers who are uh, sort of um, very aware of, of, of how this kind of stuff happens. Um, so those are probably the most immediate, sort of this, the question of the legal rights around technology and then the legal rights around the actual space itself. <laughs> and then an evolving set of legal questions evolve around the, the management of the site. and. Um, questions like, you know, if you have, I don't want to sort of open this can of worms, but somebody asked um, recently at, a, at an event, uh, what happens if a homeless person wants to sleep in the park? You know, um, these are these are uh, questions where we're not the first people to grapple with this issue. You know, it's a it's a sort of a, an intersection of you know civil liberties and uh, public space and safety and sanitation. So, um, you know, but but you know, again, it comes down to what what kind of legal requirements we have based on what kind of legal entity we are, right? If we're private or we're public, um, who we're answering to within the city, um, and, uh, and and thereby sort of what our rules are vis-a-vis -vis, um, the, the treatment of, uh, of people in the space. So that's probably something we'll be talking about in years down the road. I actually have a user experience kind of question. So are you running tests like, are you testing this idea with potential users? Are you running tests where you evaluate if people want to use actual underground park versus uh, outdoor park? So I'm just thinking, do you have any ideas on how uh, to create these spaces with user input? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think uh, everything about our technology exhibit in, um, in its last iteration was designed specifically to, to do that, right? So to see and to pull and to get information from people who actually saw the, you know, admittedly very short-term exhibit-oriented public space that we, that we created for a short time. And, you know, we collected data and information at that point in time. 
But what we're talking about with this little end lab is to exactly answer that question, is to, uh, to see how people are using um, the actual site itself, what their reactions are to it, how they would use it in a different way. Um, I think we're not asking the question right now of what people prefer to be to, to use an underground space or an above ground space, but I think we're more thinking about um, what are the attributes that would make an underground space exciting and interesting. Um, it, it could be interesting to think about um, uh, underground versus above ground. And, um, I imagine we'll probably find a bunch of things that are rather intuitive, like on a, on a beautiful sunny day. It's, it's yeah, it's way better to be outside. Um, on a, on a, on the, I think. An interesting question is what happens on a, on a freezing, icy, cold day? Um, uh, do people enjoy the experience of being in an indoor park? And uh, and sort of what does that mean? Sort of what people want to do down there? Um, what keeps them going? What, what makes them feel safe? What what do they react to? And this question of the interaction of um, humans and lighting is a really interesting dimension here. So we have a board member who's a real expert on on lighting. Um, and leads a, a, actually several companies that focus on uh, lighting technology in different ways. And um, I think the way that he puts it, he would say this much better than I do, but um, the, the weird thing about lighting is that uh, even if you don't know anything about lighting or you're not a scientist, you know when lighting is good and when it isn't. Um, uh, humans have a, a, a innate way of understanding that you know when you're on the subway and you're in this like sickening light, um, it has a real effect on your, your, your mental state and uh, the way that you're perceiving things. Um, likewise, when you're walking around on the street, it's a beautiful sunny day. It, it, has, a tr it has an entirely different effect on you. So um, this question of uh, indoor lighting and really testing what that means, what, are, what is the impact on humans of natural sunlight? Can that make people feel happier and feel better? Um, you know, um, we know that uh, the light, even in artificial ways, is, is used as a treatment for depression. And um, and uh, is something that that can really um, dramatically shift humans' moods. So this is the kind of thing that we are actually very much planning on studying, um, both on the technical side and also the sort of the psychosocial sort of softer side of how people feel and perceive uh, the space itself. Uh, yeah, I just had uh, two quick things. One was on the, on the technical side in terms of the lighting. Um, when you say full spectrum, does that mean warmth and light? Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, sorry, I'm not sure I understand your question. That, that was more of a comment. Uh, okay. And then the other actually comment I had was about um, that, that or question in the discussion is we've talked a lot about how it's a park, but I, when you bring this out to people or when you're discussing it, it's also very much, I mean, it's an indoor space. And so maybe to some of these questions about would someone rather be on a park outside or inside. I mean, there's you're inside all the time. It's not that crazy of a concept to be inside recreation. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. And I think uh, another way to frame it is uh, uh, how do we make our, our, our interior spaces uh, nicer and, um, and, and and more hospitable? Um, and sort of redefining. I mean, I, I think what we're trying to do is to redefine what the um, what what the potential value of the underground could be. And uh, is there is there a way through technology and design to make the underground into an interior space that people would um, really enjoy? How can people help? Uh, um, okay, so how can you help? We actually have a lot of, of, uh, of need. Um, the centers around uh, a few categories. So certainly we're fundraising, right? And we're we're looking for um, uh, folks who can help us. Uh, fund our next few steps. You saw what we're doing on the Lend Lab, uh, a lot of this community outreach, um, some continued design. We're doing a lot of advocacy and sort of government work behind the scenes to, to, to really sort of work with the next administration, um, whoever that person might be, to, uh, uh, to, to really make sure that this happens quickly in the next administration. Um, so on all of those fronts, there are, um, are certainly volunteer opportunities in all of the kinds of things we do, both uh, connecting deeply to the community um, Low End Lab is a is an exciting uh, opportunity for people to get involved if they have technical expertise and or um, want to help us build something kind of crazy in, a, in an environment um, like a main warehouse and in, um, in, in an AVR. Uh, we also very much uh, need funding and people who want to sponsor and and, uh, and support what we're doing. So um, if if uh, if anybody knows or has access to um, to funding streams, uh, corporate level, foundation level individual level or uh, creative mechanisms whereby we might actually be able to 
to, 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 to get some access to some resources that is, is tremendously um, uh, a huge need. Um, and I think another part of this is simply spreading the word. We, uh, we now have, I think, close to 50,000 followers of the line across all of our social networks, and um, with, including our email newsletter. And, uh, you know, but we, we would really like for this to be something that has resonance across the city and, uh, and across the world. So uh, I think a big thing that is always really helpful for us is to simply share the idea with people that you know and to, um, to do whatever uh, uh, that folks can to, to get the word out about what we're trying to do. Um, because an amazing thing about this project has really been that uh, people have just sort of generated and, 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 and shown so much excitement and so much of a willingness and a desire to get involved in some way. And uh, you know, sometimes it's people who want to sort of be our uh, pro bono graphic designer, or it's people who um, you know write us a big check and mail it to us without us even knowing who they are. Uh, and so there's all kinds of magical things that happen along the way because I think of um, some of the excitement that's been generated so far about, about what we're trying to accomplish and, and who um, we really want to be and, and the kind of process that we want to lead along the way. Do you have any celebrity endorsers? <laughs> Celebrities. Uh, we, uh, we do. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not allowed to talk about it since I'm, I'm sort of talking to the internet right now, uh, as well as you all. Uh, but we do have some high profile people that um, hopefully will be announceable and um, will, be, will be public in the next few, um, next few months. Um, it is amazing how important celebrities are to a cause. <laughs> uh, it's like the project is interesting, but then when you have a celebrity, it's like a real, a real thing, right? Um, but but we get that, and it's very much part of what we're doing. And um, you know, there are a lot of people who you know you guys have heard of who are supportive, and uh, and we're hoping to um, to get them to a place where they feel more comfortable talking about it openly and, and engaging with them. So um, I know just you know. I want to protect the, the privacy of the celebs for now. <laughs> Last question about the temperature control. What's your <coughs> plan for that? Yeah, so I mean, again, the, the Eric team is engaging with us on the questions of sort of temperature control. Um, okay, some good news is that when you're underground, uh, you are uh, able to benefit from the natural insulation of being uh, below the surface of um, of the street. Uh, so uh, in the absence, I mean, all of our experience as New Yorkers underground is essentially next to an extremely hot, um, extremely high velocity machine running through um, uh, a station without any ventilation. Um, but the natural state of the underground is actually uh, cooler in summer and warmer in winter. And uh, I think what that means is that less energy can be used when, um, when cooling in, in, in summer and heating in winter. And so uh, uh, I think a big part of our approach, like I said, we'll, we'll need artificial um, uh, air conditioning um, to keep the space comfortable. We're really imagining this is something that is to be used in a, as a year-round public amenity for flexible and varied amount of um, everything from you know, kids using it during the day to uh, an event space that could be really vibrant and exciting at night. Uh, and I think in order to do that, we need a really comfortable um, air-conditioned environment. All right, well, thanks very much.